Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. So this is going to be the second case in my Ireland's female murderers and I'm going to be covering the case of the Mulhall sisters or as they are known in the media, the Scissor sisters. Just before we get into this video, I wanted to ask you guys to please subscribe to my channel. It really does help support me and I'd love to have you here as part of our true crime family. So let's get started on the Scissor Sisters case. So on March 30th in 2005, a gentleman was enjoying his walk down the Royal Canal on the Ballyboch Road, taking in the beautiful Irish scenery, which really flourishes this time of year around spring. The gentleman was gazing upon the glistening water when he noticed something unusual floating nearby. It appeared to be a mannequin's leg with a sock still on it. As the gentleman got a bit closer to investigate, he spotted what looked like to be the mannequin's hand as well. Unsure whether these limbs belonged to a human or were dumped there by a fashion retailer, he thought it would probably be best to phone the guardie, which if you're not from Ireland is our version of the police or cops. When the guardie arrived, they immediately called in the Garda Subaqua divers. These were the remains of a human being. The divers retrieved seven body parts, including a torso. Due to the condition of the body and the fact that no head was recovered, Gardi couldn't identify the body immediately and so had to rely solely on the Irish media and news outlets for help in identifying the victim. Luckily, a programme here in Ireland called Crime Stoppers offered a large sum of money in return for information and someone came forward with the victim's name. He was identified through a t-shirt that was on the torso. The body parts belonged to a Farah Swela Noor, a 40-year-old Somalian man who had lived in Ireland since December 1996. The Department of Justice, Equality and Law Reform ordered that he be deported but he appealed and he was granted Irish citizenship in March of 1999 on the grounds that he became a father to an Irish-born child. Farah had four previous convictions for offences, including intoxication, threatening and abusive behaviour, including assault. In 1997, he had raped mentally disabled 16-year-old Chinese girl. She later gave birth to his son. Two other women had children by Farah, and both had described as being raped by him. Farah had faced eight charges of disorder and assault, one involving sexual assault, in which a knife was found at the scene by Gardi. He was convicted on three occasions, but never served any jail time. At the time of his death, Farah was in a relationship with a woman called Kathleen Mulhall. Sorry guys, I just got a bit warm, so I just threw up my hair. Kathleen Mulhall was a married mother of six when she first met Farah. She left her husband for Farah and they both moved into a rented apartment in Summerhill, Dublin. And Kathleen was no stranger to Farah's violent behaviour. So on the 20th of March 2005, St. Patrick's Day weekend, Kathleen, Farah and two of her adult daughters decided to go into Dublin city centre and get drunk. They purchased vodka and coke and all decided to drink it while walking around Dublin for the day. Later on, they had returned back to Farah and Kathleen's apartment, but the women wanted to continue on the Paddy's Day celebrations. And so Kathleen's daughters, Linda and Charlotte, aged 30 and 21, shared out some ecstasy pills. Their mother joined in, but Farah had felt that the alcohol had already hit him enough. Kathleen, not impressed with Farah's dismissal of the pills, crushed one up and slipped it into his drink. As the party was kicking off, Linda and Farah were sat on a two-seater couch and Charlotte on the armrest. Farah started touching Linda in a sexual way. He whispered into Linda's ear, put his arms around her waist and refused to let her go. This obviously enraged Kathleen and so she began shouting at Farah to get off of her daughter. Farah got up and started shoving Kathleen and shouting in her face. He was moving his thumb across his neck and threatening to kill her. Linda and Charlotte, witnessing the abuse, were getting fired up. It wouldn't take much to set them off and when their mother Kathleen shouted at them to just kill him for me, Charlotte picked up a Stanley knife, 
grabbed Farah up by the head and pulled the blade across his throat, sending him to the floor. Linda then ran to the kitchen and grabbed a hammer and hit him on the head multiple times in a frenzy while their mother was watching. Charlotte continued to stab Farah no less than 27 times and Linda struck him again and again. Kathleen at this point returned to the couch with her vodka and watched her TV. When the carnage was over, the sisters walked over to their mother and said, He's dead. We're after killing him, ma. Kathleen looked upon her blood-soaked children and burst into tears. Charlotte and Linda broke down too and the three women huddled together. After an undetermined amount of time, the enormity of the killing had sunk in. Get him out of here. You must get him out of here, demanded Kathleen. Not in their right minds and with little knowledge of disposing of a five foot six man's body, they improvised. The two sisters dragged his body into the bathroom. Linda found a bread knife in the kitchen, but she was too sick to take part in the next bit. She handed the knife to Charlotte, sat down on the toilet seat and covered her face. We can only speculate that due to the amount of alcohol and drugs that the girls had taken, they were unable to think up any other alternative method of disposing of Farah's body, other than dismembering his body parts. Charlotte took control. She took the bread knife to slice apart Farah's body, starting with his leg. Linda would eventually join in using a hammer. Fueled by alcohol and drugs, the girls carved his body into nine separate pieces and then threw them into body bags. The head they kept separate. Exhausted, the girls decided to join their mother for another vodka. Next, they had to decide how they were going to dispose of the black bags. And in desperation, with nowhere else to turn, the girls rang their father. At first, he just thought the girls were having another one of their usual paranoid drugged up fits. It was late at night and he didn't fancy humouring them, so he hung up. Then his ex-wife, who had betrayed him and humiliated him, got on the phone. He told them the same story that the girls had told them and begged him to help them. He realised that his girls must be desperate and so agreed to go to the apartment. Only when the girls showed him the bags and he saw the gruesome contents did reality set in. He refused to help with the disposing of the body. But out of compassion for his daughters, he agreed to get rid of the blood-soaked towels and bedsheets, and he brought them with him once he left. Once again, Charlotte took control. She stuffed the black bags into two sports bags and orchestrated a plan to dump the body parts in the Royal Canal. The canal was only a short distance from the apartment, but it took all three women five trips to dump all of the body parts, except for the head. They agreed that the quickest way for anybody to identify these body parts was through Farah's face, meaning the quicker that the guardi would be knocking on their doors. So they decided to keep the head separate and to bury it elsewhere. When they returned to the apartment, they'd done a deep clean of the crime scene. The apartment never looked so clean. By now it was noon, so the girls placed the head in a camera bag and planned to take it to Tymon Park and bury it. They left the apartment but before they could get to the bus stop, they decided to stop for food. CCTV footage shows the women in a mini market queuing at the deli with Linda carrying the camera bag on her back. Once they arrived at the park, they wandered around for hours trying to find the best place to bury the head. And while they stopped for a cigarette, Charlotte began clawing at the ground with her bare fingers. The soil was hard and the hole was shallow, but she just wanted it done. So she took the head out of the bag and rolled it into the hole under the watchful eyes of her sisters. She then kicked the dirt back over the head. By now it was 7.30. While Charlotte stared down at the mound of earth, she realised that it was actually her 22nd birthday and this would surely be a birthday that she would never forget. So 10 days later, Linda decided to go and check in on her mother. And as she walked over a bridge that overlooked the canal, she saw a commotion. A group of people were gathered together and were talking. And when she saw members of the Gardi present, it was in this moment that she knew they had found the body parts. The Mulhall women knew that it would only be a matter of time before the body parts were identified. Linda, being the most sensitive out of the three women, became paranoid that the head would be found. 
So after many sleepless nights and days of heavy drinking, she went back to Tymon Park and dug up the head. When she got back home, she told her mother and sister what she had done, but they wanted nothing to do with it, and so Linda was on her own. She went into her kitchen, grabbed a bottle of vodka and a hammer, emptied the contents of her son's school bag, and placed the head, hammer, and vodka inside it. Packed up, she headed for Killinarden Hill, which was only a 45 minute walk from her house. It was early morning and no one was around. Linda walked far into the field, kissed the bag and said she was sorry. She'd sat down and drank the bottle of vodka before bludgeoning the bag with the hammer and fell asleep. When she woke up, it was getting dark. So she put the head in a mud patch and covered it with surrounding soil before lighting the bag on fire and going home to bed. Charlotte and Kathleen, on the other hand, seemed to be coping with the murder better than Linda. Just days after Farah's death, Charlotte had sold his jewellery and his mobile phone. The phone was sold to a colleague of their father. Kathleen and Charlotte even took a trip to Manchester using the money from Farah's bank account. They partied for a week in England before returning home to Ireland and joining Linda in watching the case unravel through the Irish media and news outlets. It did take the Gardaí a month to identify Farah's body, and this happened on the 9th of May, 2005. A bus driver named Muhammad Ali Abu Bakr, I am sorry, I could be pronouncing that wrong, was flicking through the Metro Erin when he saw a public service announcement. The Gardaí were appealing for information on the identity of a dismembered body. Muhammad immediately recognised the photo of the white Ireland away football jersey. His friend Farah had been wearing one similar the last time that he had saw him. That, coupled with the fact that he was unable to get a hold of Farah for weeks, was enough to raise his suspicion, and so he contacted the Gardaí. He told Gardaí that the last time he saw Farah was when Farah and Kathleen and her two daughters were in Dublin city centre. So now with the name to go from, the detectives interviewed Farah's former partner, Mary, and took a saliva sample from her son, whom Farah had fathered. They visited Farah's last known address, which was Kathleen's apartment, but she told them that Farah had left with an ex-girlfriend and that she hadn't seen him in a very long time. The detectives noticed that patches of carpet didn't match up and so requested to take swabs of the carpet, walls and furniture for DNA testing. Meanwhile, they traced Farah's phone to John Mulhall, the girl's father. The Mulhall sisters would visit their brothers in jail during the months after the murder. This wasn't out of the ordinary, but what the girls told their brothers would prove to be their downfall. They would tell their brothers exactly what they had done. They were looking for advice or even just a shoulder to cry on. In turn, on the 11th of July, Garda Damien Duffy received a very unusual phone call. It was from one of the Mulhall brothers. The following day, Gardy interviewed the brothers and were shocked when they heard every last detail of the gruesome murder of Farah Noor. The same day that the detectives had visited the brothers in jail, the DNA results came back from Farah's son and the apartment. This confirmed that the body that had been dumped in the canal was that of Farah Noor. This was enough to make arrests. They got Kathleen, Charlotte, Linda and John all at the same time at 10 a.m. on August 3rd. They were all kept at separate locations for interrogation, but no one would talk. After 12 hours of questioning and no answers, and with circumstantial evidence at best, the Gardaí had no choice but to let them all go. After this, Kathleen cut all contact with her daughters. Charlotte went back to her life of prostitution and Linda moved in with her father, John. Linda would cave first. Pressure from her father and her other sister meant that just 16 days after the arrest, she made a full written confession to the Gardaí, detailing the events that took place on March 20th and 21st. On September 14th, Linda was arrested and charged with Noor's murder. Kathleen was arrested following Linda's confession but she denied having any involvement in Farah's death. She even said that Linda was mentally disturbed and bulimic. With no real evidence, the Gardaí had no choice but to once again let Kathleen go. When Charlotte was arrested, 
She would claim that it was her mother who murdered Farah and that her and her sister had nothing to do with it. But after only five hours of interrogation, Charlotte would give in. And on the 17th of October, Charlotte was also charged with Farah Noor's murder. John Mulhall, who was Charlotte and Linda's father, was faced with the reality that he now had four of his six children in jail for horrendous crimes. He thought that he had failed his family, and so sadly on the 8th of December that year, he took his own life. A nine-day trial of Linda and Charlotte began on October 12th, 2006. It took a jury a total of 18 hours to reach a verdict. Charlotte Mulhall was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Linda Mulhall was found guilty of manslaughter and was sentenced to 14 years in prison. Their mother, who had conveniently been absent from all of the court hearings, had in fact moved to Birmingham to her brother in England. But in 2008, she had returned and was arrested and found guilty of helping to clean up a murder scene, withholding information and giving false information. She was sentenced to five years in prison. She would serve only three. Linda served 12 years of her 14-year sentence and it is believed that she now lives in the UK. While in jail, her and her sister Charlotte ran the prison hair and beauty salon, which was nicknamed Head and Shoulders by fellow inmates, as a crude reference to the way that the sisters had dismembered Farah's body. In the media, the sisters would become known as the Scissor Sisters. Charlotte is still in prison to this day. In November 2017, Charlotte was caught with a male prison officer in her ensuite bathroom. He was flustered and suspicion rose that the two were intimate with each other, despite the fact that the prison officer was married. In December 2020, Charlotte was caught semi-naked and supposedly having sex with another prison officer. So she was transferred and is currently spending the rest of her sentence in Limerick jail. Although she has been in the media lately appealing this transfer because she wants to stay close to her family in Dublin. So that is all I have on this case. There is so much more information about this case out there on the internet and in books. So if you do want to find out more, I do recommend that you go and research it for yourselves. I just wanted to go over some of the main parts of this case with you guys. I hope you did find this video interesting, for lack of a better word. And if you did, please, again, don't forget to subscribe. It really does help support me and give this video a thumbs up. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Take care, stay safe. Bye. Clean. No fish. Fucking Bidman. Fucking Bidman prison. And it's thought.